The association was founded in 1890 to promote public interest in the economic and social potential of the Coosa, Alabama River system from Rome, Georgia to Mobile, Alabama. The system is developed from Mobile to Montgomery, but not the Coosa River leg. It's the construction of this section that is of concern to the members in light of recent federal attempts not to provide funding for the water projects. The guest speaker at the association luncheon was U.S. Senator Howell Heflin. Alabama's freshman senator predicted in the years to come the nation's water resources would be just as important as its energy resources. He said that further development of all of the nation's waterways depends upon the attitude of the federal government. Thanks to the hard work of the Alabama congressional delegation in the past, and in particular to the efforts of Congressman Tom Bevel in his capacity as chairman of the House Public Works Appropriations Subcommittee, ample monies have been approved for the advanced design and engineering work on the Coosa River navigation. Yet the future of this project still depends on the direction of the federal government's policies affecting waterways. And there is no clear direction now. In fact, how the nation deals with its water resources, including navigable rivers, is a major issue facing the 96th Congress. It could well be that this Congress will determine the future role of the federal government in water resource development. At the annual meeting, the association launched a new educational project aimed at producing materials about the river system to be used by school districts in the river system area. Dennis Latham, WSFA TV News at the Civic Center. Under the law, the state of Florida could stop anything within the area that would be the estuarine sanctuary, and that would include 20 miles of our waterway, which is an interstate uh, resource, of course. What about the access of the barges coming from the state docks at Eufaula, Phoenix City, and Columbia as far as their access to the Gulf of Mexico? If the law is constitutional, which we don't believe it is, uh, the state of Florida could stop any barge passage uh, from Alabama ports. What would this do as far as commerce and the utilization of the state docks? Well, it would make them worthless. It would make the state docks worthless other than salvage value, I would say. Most of the events today at the state meet were preliminary events. However, the boys' two-mile run in Class 4A was completed, and it was won by Steve Rowe of Huntsville, who had a time of 9 minutes and 42.02 seconds. The boys' shot put in Class 4A was also completed, and the winner was Darrell Stevens of Parker with a distance of 53 feet and 7 and 3 quarters inches. Currently, Murphy High School of Mobile is leading in the team standings with 7 points, but Montgomery's Lee High School is expected to win the meet, and their strong events have yet to be completed. The state meet resumes tomorrow at Garrett Coliseum at 11 a.m. with the field events that consist of the long jump and the pole vault. At 2 p.m., the track events start with the 60-yard dash finals. The final event of the meet will be the mile relay finals at 7.15 tomorrow night to be followed by the award presentations. In action this afternoon, one record was broken. Buzzy Holsington of Grissom broke her own record in the two-mile run with a time of 11 minutes and 49.36 seconds. James Spann, WSFA TV Sports. Watson, seated at the table with Stabler, requested uh, Miss Dykes to buy him a key lockbox that's magnetic in type. She left there, went uh, to a local hardware store, purchased this lockbox, returned and gave it to Mr. Watson in the presence of Mr. Stabler there. And this girl, Joyce Likes, she was there whenever the place closed we started to leave and I couldn't get my car and we attempted to get in through coat hanger device but these new cars hadn't got a 
little hook on the thing, and we couldn't get it out, so we had to call a locksmith out of Foley. He came out there at 2 o'clock in the morning and I think charged me $12, $15 to open it. And then the very next two or three days later, I'd done the same thing again. So she, and she and Ken and Bohem mentioned that you should get, and they joking about it, said you should get you a key case or hide you a key somewhere. And I said, well, I will next chance I get. So I was down there, and she was fixing to go to the store, and I said, well, why are you going? How about picking me up a key case? So she did, and I took the key case and had me an extra key made and put it in my car on the outside where I could get to it in case I did lock it up again. And this is the same key case that we have right here? Right. Uh, then, as far as you're concerned, it's just coincidence that, uh, that the same kind of key case turned up under uh, Padecki's car. Yes, all it could be. I'm sure there's several thousand of the same kind of key cases. All I've seen is just alike anyway. What do you make of Padecki in this affair, Randall? Well, I've only met Padecki just one time, and my impression was that from what I'd heard Kenny talk about before, that he was down there just to get a story, and he couldn't get a story, and digging up dirt because all the questions he would ask anybody would be anything that would be detrimental. He'd ask questions, you know, like, does the man speed? Does he get arrested for uh, drunken driving? Does he get a uh, fight a lot? And asked, and he'd never ask any kind of question about what good he do, about his football camp for kids, or, uh, you know, anything that was, that was anything that man had done good for the community. How do you think that cocaine got under that guy's car? Well, if in fact it was cocaine, I guess the only... My only conclusion would be he bought it with him from California because a simple reason, Kenny didn't get where he's at. He can't lead a team to the Super Bowl and all that stuff without by being dumb. He's too smart to pull anything like that, and anybody in that community would know that anything they done like that would be real bad for Kenny. And I believe that this man, this is the only way he could get a story and get national recognition because way five, six weeks ago, nobody never heard of him. Now then, he's got a copyrighted story. He's been in all the press. He's been in People magazines on quick. His name's been right in front of everybody ever since then. I believe it was a well-planned thing by him. And I like to say that Kenny's the one that got set up, and I think it was by Padecki, because he's the only one that had anything to gain. That's the only logical explanation it could be. Just act, I just, I never seen him act like that. I seen him be mean at times, but I never seen him act, act like that, just screaming to the top of his voice and everything. I, I, I have sent a letter to uh, Barry Tigg, who's the United States Attorney and Head of Justice Department, asking him to conduct an investigation into the cross burning out at my place where I live and uh, out in uh, North Montgomery, close to where my parents live, and also conduct an investigation into the Montgomery Police Department for constant harassment and intimidation by members of the Montgomery Police Department. I attempted to discuss the issues with Mayor Emory Farmer. Mayor Farmer commenced to curse me out and hang the telephone up on me. As a result, I have no other alternative but to ask the Justice Department to please come in and uh, help us. Barry Tigg has stated to me last night, and I talked with him about three hours, he stated to me that he was going to investigate it and that if there are any violation by the mayor or any member of the police department, that he was going to arrest them and bring them before the federal grand jury for indictment. And I believe that he meant what he said. After months of controversy, William Evans was sworn in as sheriff of Coosa County during ceremonies at the county courthouse. Evans was elected as sheriff last fall, but was not sworn in until now because of a suit filed by incumbent Sheriff Beston Peters, who was defeated by Evans in the September 26 Democratic primary runoff. In the suit filed in the U.S. District Court on November 27, Peters contended that the casting of illegal ballots caused Evans to win the election. Among other defendants in the case were probate judge Jasper Fielding and members of the County Democratic Executive Committee. In his ruling on the suit, U.S. District Judge Robert Varner stated that Evans was legally elected sheriff of Coosa County. The ruling also stated that there was no proof that enough illegal ballots were cast to affect the election's outcome. After the swearing-in ceremony, Sheriff Evans seemed relieved that the debate was over. Well, I think everybody will go along with uh, the kind of department that I'm going to run, and I want to be the sheriff of the people of all of Coosa County, and I think everybody will cooperate. Most people here seem to feel that the matter is settled, but whether or not the controversy is really over remains to be seen. Elaine Stewart, WSFA-TV News. 
Well, I imagine the thing that most people are interested in are the sprints. And of course, uh, in the sprints, uh, Joe Yelder from Jeff Davis High School holds a record. It was set back, I believe, in 1966 at, at six flat. And of course, uh, Kenny Simon from uh, Lee this year uh, possibly will be a threat to that record, and many people will be interested in that. And of course, Kenny is an excellent hurdler. And uh, the hurdle record in the high hurdles was set by Richard Gillette from uh, Jeff Davis High School back in 73, I believe it was. And uh, Kenny would probably come pretty close to this record. I believe Richard's record was uh, six and nine tenths seconds. And most of the schools here in Montgomery have um, <coughs> entries in, in this year's? Oh, yes. Uh, all the senior high schools and I think all of the junior highs. Uh, it may be of interest to some people in the Montgomery area, but the uh, junior high division usually is uh, won by a Montgomery junior high school in, in the indoor and outdoor uh, season as well. Okay, how about admission <coughs> to the general public? Uh, what, what do the tickets cost in uh, that time? Well, uh, tickets for the high school meet, of course, are, are very cheap. Uh, $1 for students for all day and $2 for adults. So if anybody wants to come out uh, on Friday, beginning at 10 o'clock in the morning, then uh, the, the students can come in for $1 and stay until about 10 o'clock that night, or adults can come in for $2 and uh, also stay un until 10 o'clock that night. The track uh, events on Friday will begin at 1 p.m. and on Saturday will begin at 2 p.m. In 1948, the city of Selma signed a lease with the federal government allowing them the use of the land that is now known as Craig Airfield. In 1950, the city signed another lease with the federal government conveying to them that same piece of property. To accomplish all of this, Selma had to get approval from the state legislature, which they did prior to the 1948 agreement, but not before the 1950 accord. The first agreement assured the city of Selma a return of the land if the property was no longer in use as an air base. The second agreement made no such concession. The argument before the justices now questioned the city's right to have made the 1950 agreement. U.S. Attorney W.A. Kimbrough asserts that the second agreement is valid. The two deeds that were given to the United States in 1948-1950 were authorized by the act of the legislature that was passed for that purpose. So the, the 1950 deed was, was in fact valid? That is my position, that's correct. Joe Pilcher, a board member of the Craig Airfield and Industrial Authority, however, sees that the 1950 Act was not valid. The second deed, we contend, was void because the original act of the Alabama legislature, which authorized a conveyance, provided that the conveyance was to be by one of two alternative methods. 
either by a deed with reversionary clauses or without reversionary clauses. The city elected to convey with the reversionary clause, and we contend that that election was binding. And that was the 1948 deed? That was the 1948 deed. That boils the entire question down to this. Did the Alabama legislature in its original act before 1948 allow the city of Selma to make only one agreement with the federal government or as many as it took to create an air base? The nine Alabama Supreme Court justices brought their court to Selma for several reasons. One of them to hear the case involving Craig Airfield and the city of Selma. As a supplementary reason, they brought their court to the Selma High School to allow the Selma school students and Selma citizens an opportunity to see the Supreme Court in action. Chris Grimshaw in Selma, WSFA TV News. In the midst of many faltering private institutions, Huntington College seems to remain resolute. Huntington President Alan Jackson attributes the school's success to many faithful alumni. The campus scene today is far different from the Tuskegee Female College founded in 1854. Although Huntington is still under the guidance and support of the United Methodist Church, Jackson says the co-ed college is launching a $13 million expansion program aimed to meet the needs of any Alabama student. For instance, we're adding a new uh, faculty person in business administration to emphasize managing and marketing. We think this is a new area that has not been a part of our curriculum and uh, we'll have a full-time teacher in this area where we've not had anyone there before. Of course, uh, with the science uh, building renovation, uh, we'll be looking at all of the health-related areas. There are a good many new expanding health-related uh, programs that uh, we will be developing. We are just now offering a program which uh, prepares people who are thinking about uh, administration of a nursing home or a hospital, combining both their uh, scientific background with business administration. This is a new area for us. We, of course, uh, have always had a good, strong program in preparation of those going on to uh, full-time church vocations, but we're adding a full-time chaplain uh, this fall who will uh, be involved in uh, working with students that will go out to become directors of Christian education. Uh, this will be an expanding area as uh, our church is looking increasingly for professional help in developing their educational programs. Janet May, WSFA TV News. Uh, he felt that if he uh, were made the temporary receiver, he would have much more direct control over problems uh, with the uh, corrections inst institutions in the state. And uh, in this way, he would have the authority to deal with those problems as quickly as possible. Now, does he have any specific plans to get to the, quote, heart of the problem? Well, I'm sure there's been some discussion, and uh, I'm sure he's done a lot of thinking along that line, but uh, this is, is considered a start, uh, something, uh, a point from which we can work and decide exactly what are the problems and what are the solutions. Who has he been conferring with on this matter? Well, he's dealt uh, very closely with uh, the Speaker of the House and the Lieutenant Governor. And he's met twice with uh, Judge Johnson in uh, recent weeks and uh, has been uh, in discussions with uh, uh, the staff people who are involved in agencies that might be affected by this order. Okay. Has he had any communication with uh, Larry Bennett so far? Um, I believe they met last week, This, uh, and I believe they are scheduled to meet Monday. He would be amenable to delaying the session should legislators feel they need more time to look at, at the proposed Constitution. Uh, he doesn't feel locked in to the February 13th date if uh, a better Constitution will come out of a delay. Have you been getting any feedback from the special committee? I'm sure that they've had discussions with him, but I, I don't believe any specific request for a delay has come from the committee.
Two persons were injured today in a two-car accident on the Lower Wetumpka Road at Pauline Street. According to accident investigators, a local taxi turned right onto the Lower Wetumpka Road off of Pauline into the path of the oncoming subcompact car. A 60-year-old Baffin Court man, Pete Taylor, sustained the more serious injuries. Paramedics treated him on the scene for a broken left arm, lacerations on his face, and possible internal injuries. Taylor was taken to Jackson Hospital and admitted in fair condition. Another Baffin Court man, Charlie White, sustained some head injuries, but he was sent home after an examination at Jackson's in good condition. This accident is still under investigation by the Montgomery Police. This is Michael Jones, WSFA TV News reporting. Beginning next week, there will be a new system for getting directory assistance help. Central Bell spokesman Tom Somerville says the biggest change will be a charge for the use of directory assistance. The uh, most fundamental component is the uh, new number that customers will be dialing. Instead of just 411, now they'll need to dial 1 plus 411. And I think most pe people are familiar with the fact that uh, each telephone line will have uh, five free calls available to it and uh, that uh, the customers will be charged 20 cents per call for uh, anything above that five call allowance. Uh, also, there uh, will be uh, certain exemptions available. Uh, people who are handicapped and unable to use the telephone directory are eligible to be exempted from any charges, and they simply need to call the telephone business office to find out about that. And, of course, calls from coin phones, from hotel, uh, motel guest rooms, and from hospital uh, patient rooms uh, will not uh, be uh, charged. Directory assistance calls will affect the customer only if the call is for a local number or a number within the state. However, as one major exception, a long-distance statewide directory assistance call will not be counted if a long-distance call is made from that same number on the same day. Each customer will have the privilege of five directory assistance calls at no charge, with the additional benefit of obtaining three numbers per call, a total of 15 numbers per billing period. It won't necessarily be from like February the 1st till uh, March the 1st. It will be according to what your billing period is. It will cover a monthly billing period. Beginning Monday, you'll have to dial 1 and then 411 to get directory assistance aid. The 1555-1212 number will not change. The directory assistance pricing has not been a new concept. Some states have had it since 1974, like Cincinnati. South Central Bell has been toying with the idea for some time. A recent Public Service Commission hearing on South Central zoning boundaries pushed the concept to the forefront. South Central lost nearly $5 million in rezoning charges and tax changes. The Public Service Commission, however, said they could implement the directory assistance charge to help compensate for the loss. South Central is predicting a $5 million profit from the change, but that only balances out their losses. South Central Bell has drawn its statistics for directory assistance repricing from other Bell system offices, such as Kentucky and Georgia, who have had the assistance charges for some time. Those statistics show that the directory assistance charges will be felt by only 1 in 10 customers, and most of them will be business and not residential customers. Chris Grimshaw, WSFA TV News. A study of statistics last fall shows the number of full-time students at Southern colleges has declined, but women now represent more than 50% of college enrollment in the South. 
The study shows total university and college enrollment of full-time students declined by 2.9% nationwide, but only 2.2% in the South. The most significant single change was Southern enrollment of women. Total enrollment of women in the South for the fall of 1978 was 50.1% as compared to a national average of 49.9%. At Auburn University, Dr. Wilbur Tincher says female enrollment at Auburn is up dramatically. The number of women at Auburn has been increasing over the last several years and uh, the, uh, the present uh, percentage uh, at Auburn uh, of women is um, 42% compared to 58% uh, men. Now, um, 25 years ago, that percent was 24%. And uh, 15, 15 years ago, it was 29%. Uh, and nationwide, I'm told, um, as of the fall quarter, it was about 50-50, men and women. One thing that keeps uh, coming up uh, when we talk with prospective parents, or um, when we talk with prospective students and their parents, is the fact that they want their daughters to come to Auburn. We ask them why. They seem to feel that Auburn um, is a place where their daughter will be protected to some extent. Uh, you know, Auburn is a small college town, mm -hmm. and um, they like the atmosphere here. Uh, I think this is, this is a, a one reason <coughs> that uh, more and more students, more and more women, are applying uh, to Auburn. I think the academic programs here at Auburn have, good, have a good reputation, and I think this is why we're attracting both men and women. Dr. Tincher says one reason for the decline in full-time enrollment is the fact that high school graduating classes peaked last year. I think another factor uh, in the enrollment um, in college and universities throughout the country is that uh, last year was the, the peak year in terms of uh, graduates from high schools. And I think that uh, the, um, the pool of college-age people will, will get smaller for the next several years, I think until about the mid-80s, mid and then we're told that it will begin to get larger. Tomorrow night, we'll examine enrollment trends at the University of Alabama and talk with Dean Lawrence Durham. I'm Bob Howell, WSFA-TV News. The 14 to 16 story structure would be built on this plot of ground at Court Street and I-85. It's slated to be a 288 room Hilton luxury hotel. Montgomery area Chamber of Commerce President Taylor Dawson was asked what's left to be done before construction can begin. Well, the general partner that's putting the hotel together has, has not finished his initial subscription of, of partners. And I think if and when that's done, uh, ground will be broken as soon as the architect can get his plans complete. What's the cost of the hotel? The plans evidently are pretty far along. Cost of the hotel, uh, the project totally will be about an $8 million project. The hotel itself will cost about $6 million or $7 million of, of, of the eight. Right here is Court Street. And th this elevation right here faces the capital. That'll be a good view of the capital. And, and this, this is an outside elevator, and there's not a building in Montgomery that has one. And this will basically face Prattville, or the interchange of, of I-85 and I-75. I imagine on this lot that this hotel will be well seen. Oh, you can see this. The visibility is, is, is considerable. You'll be able to see it uh, probably from the time uh, that you, on the interstate coming from Atlanta to when you get to the uh, Eastern Bypass, and, and you'll be able to see it from Prattville. What did you find out from the feasibility study that was done for the hotel? The feasibility study indicated that Montgomery needs and can support a hotel of this type. And the feasibility study also uh, stated that, that this location, which is on the corner of Court Street and I 85, is probably the best hotel site in the city. So I, I think that uh, the, the promoters will, will put it together and, and that, uh, that, that someday a hotel will be here and by someday I'm talking about next year or two. Dawson said the feasibility study showed that with the amount of traffic coming into the city, a new hotel could easily be supported. Ivy Berman, WSFA-TV News.